So I'm old enough to remember Chubby Checkers, although I'm not as old as Earl. Um, so I am so honored to have been asked to speak here today and to have been asked to pay tribute to someone as legendary in this community as Earl Silbert. As you just heard, I worked on the Iran-Contra investigation. I actually came here from New York, where I'd been a federal prosecutor, came down to, to uh, D.C. in 1987, and in being involved in the Iran-Contra investigation, I basically got to know all of the major criminal defense lawyers in town. It became very clear to me immediately that the dean of the bar here was Earl Silbert. He has a reputation as a brilliant lawyer, the go-to person for clients in real trouble, and most importantly, and a theme I'm gonna come back to a couple times, a person of unquestioned integrity. If Earl tells you something, it's true, and he will stand behind it. That enduring trait of Earl is so refreshing today in our public sphere. Let me just talk a little bit about Earl. He's, as you, I'm sure you all know, he's from Boston. He's enormously proud of those roots and for very good reason. He went to Exeter for a high school, Tony Private School in, uh, the, in the Northeast, then to Harvard College and to Harvard Law School. After graduating from Harvard Law School, he went to the tax division of the Department of Justice, and that doesn't fit really with the Earl Silbert I know. Uh, Earl, I have no idea how you got to the tax division. It, and uh, uh, anyway, you ended up there, apparently not for very long. He uh, fairly quickly applied to be a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the District of Columbia. Earl has commented that at the time he applied for that position, he wasn't entirely sure what a federal prosecutor did. Uh, let's say that he figured that out pretty quickly and became one of the truly legendary prosecutors that the Washington, D.C. has ever seen. He came to believe and has said that his early years in the U.S. Attorney's Office, dealing essentially with victims of crime, the police, and, and the chaos of street crime were among the most happy years that he ever served, and that sounds very much like the Earl that I know. As everyone knows, Earl became the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia during one of the most crucial times in our history, and that is the time period of Watergate. The, the, everyone will remember that various uh, burglars ultimately associated with the President Nixon's reelection campaign broke into the DNC headquarters that was located in the Watergate Hotel, which as you know is the reason we have gate at the end of all our scandals. <laughs> Earl tried the first case against those burglars before there was a special counsel and he convicted them at trial soundly. They were facing significant periods of incarceration, and that conviction was the motivator for them to cooperate against the hires up and eventually all the way up to the President of the United States. None of that would have happened without excellent trial work by Earl at that trial leading to those convictions. Not many of us can say that we changed world history Earl Silber changed history. It's a fitting that this tribute to Earl is happening really at this moment of our history. The country is once again talking about special counsels, U.S. v. Nixon, impeachment, pardons, obstruction of justice by a president, convictions of associates of the president. We don't know how the current saga will end, but we know how Watergate ended with a vindication of the rule of law and the unwavering belief that no person, no matter how powerful and no matter his or her role in the government is above the law. <laughs> and Watergate ended that way in part because of the tremendous courage and lawyering of our Earl Silbert.
As you have heard, Earl's been involved with the fishing school since the early 1990s, not long after Tom Lewis opened the school. That's a long time to be associated with any one outside organization. Earl's currently a board member and previously served as vice chair of the board. The mission of the fishing school is as important as any that we confront in our society. Helping kids from underserved communities with lower incomes, with academic and life skills, and helping their parents through engagement programs and activities. It all starts with our kids. Institutions such as the fishing school are to be cherished and nurtured, just as the school cherishes and nurtures the kids that it teaches. And I am so appreciative to all of you for attending today and supporting the fishing school. Clap for all of you. So to get ready for this talk today, I looked into Earl's background. And as I looked into it, don't worry, I'm getting to the, that part later, Earl. Um, as I looked into it, it became clear to me that it's not actually all that surprising that Earl uh, decided that the fishing school would be one of his passions. First, it turns out that Earl actually always wanted to be a teacher more than he wanted to be a lawyer. He thought about going into teaching both before and after law school. And when Earl graduated from college, his first choice actually would have been to be a teacher and not a law student. And he might have gone into teaching, except he didn't have a teaching certificate. And so going to Harvard Law School was his backup plan. <laughs> I don't know if Harvard Law School knows that it was a backup plan. Harvard, Earl may be the only law student at Harvard for which that was the backup plan, um, and I wouldn't put that uh, out there exactly. Um, during the last two, in his continuing just his passion on education, during the last two years of law school, Earl lived as a proctor advisor in Harvard freshman dorms, counseling new Harvard law, not law students, new Harvard undergraduate students during what is obviously a very stressful time for all of them. And during Earl's third year of law school, he taught writing to uh, freshmen at, uh, in the undergraduate school at Harvard. So I went to law school. I have no idea where Earl found all this extra time. I just barely got through working full time as being a lawyer. And Earl is out uh, helping other people as well as getting through school. And that's a lot about what Earl is like. As I mentioned, after graduating from Harvard Law School, Oler went to the Tax Division of the Department of Justice. While at the Department, after while at the Department of Justice, he took two or three semesters of classes at George Washington University, once again seeking to get his teaching certificate. <laughs> I think the law profession should be uh, grateful that that career path never actually panned out for him, although I'm sure he would have been a spectacular teacher. Earl also has a lifelong history of working directly with kids from underprivileged backgrounds. When he was at Harvard College, Earl worked with underprivileged kids in Boston. In law school at Harvard, he worked with the Legal Aid Bureau, which is, although not directly with kids, is assisting assisted low-income people in need of legal help. While at the Department of Justice after law school, I love this story, Earl and four friends established what they called the Metropolitan Athletic Association, which was later called the Metropolitan Athletic and Educational Cultural Association. They organized basketball and softball leagues for underprivileged kids at one point, Earl had 28 teams in his basketball league. Earl spent every Saturday at the gym running the league, sometimes even refereeing the games when he was short on refs. During this time, he was also involved with a group doing social and recreational work at the Richardson Housing Project on East Capitol. Many of us donate money to these types of activities. Fewer of us, like Earl, donate the precious gift of time. The fishing school started, as you've heard, around 1990 with five kids in a crack house in Northeast. You know, lots of people would think 
really five kids? Is that really worth all the effort? Is that really worth renovating a crack house over? But the fishing school had a great vision. And as you've heard, the fishing school has now dealt with thousands of kids and thousands of families to help them transition and learn the basic life skills and reading and math to be successful. And there is no important, more important job that we have. And I appreciate all of you being here to support it. We, and we're here in Washington. A lot of us um, uh, really want to work on sort of big policy issues. We tend to forget that many of these policy issues are actually designed to help individual people. And I'm going to tell a story about that, and I'll come back and in the middle of this story, you're going to think to yourself, like, why is he over there? At the end, I'll come back and tell you why. I was at the, I was the White House from 2014 to 2017 as Obama's White House counsel. And I worked on big issues. I worked on Obamacare, immigration reform, criminal justice reform, the Iran nuclear deal, climate change and the, and the Paris Agreement, lots of big policy issues. But I also ran President Obama's clemency initiative. It was an initiative he designed to grant clemency to deserving inmates sentenced to long sentences primarily for drug offenses. We organized thousands of lawyers around the United States who helped inmates submit petitions to the Department of Justice. Those recommendations came to me at the White House from the Department of Justice, and I wrote memos to the president and collate them and, and provide them to the president. And what struck me as we were doing that is lawyers from all over the White House, the vice president's office, the Domestic Policy Council, the Staff Secretary's Office, the National Security Council, all came to me and asked if they could work on the project. Mind you, these were people with full-time jobs, and at the White House, a full-time job is like more than a full-time job. And yet, they wanted to work on this project. And when the project was finally over, those lawyers all came to me and thank me for giving them the opportunity to work on the project. Ultimately, the president granted clemency to over 1,700 inmates. And I've often thought, why was there such an outpouring of passion from people in the White House to become involved in the clemency project? And as I've thought about it, I've really come to this realization. We were helping individual people who had filed clemency petitions. We learned about their lives, their families, their struggles. We knew that when the president granted a petition, that inmate and his or her entire family would weep with joy. Mothers would see their children sometimes for the first time outside of prison. Fathers would hug their sons. There was a real person with a name and a history who benefited from what we did, and that was rewarding beyond description. In the summer of 2016, Valerie Jarrett and I invited half, uh, oh, excuse me, half a dozen commutation recipients to the White House to hear their stories. We met in a conference room in the West Wing of the White House, and we talked for an hour or so. One had been, uh, sentence had been commuted by President Clinton, if I'm remembering this right, one by President Bush, and I think four by President uh, Obama, the second President Bush. Then something happened that Valerie and I knew was gonna happen, but they didn't. The, the conference room, there's a really only one conference room in the West Wing of the White House, and it's a very ornate room. It's called the Roosevelt Room. There's a bust of Teddy Roosevelt. I think some president added Eleanor Roosevelt. They decided if it's gonna be called the Roosevelt Room, you should add Eleanor, so there's a bust of Eleanor in there as well. <coughs> the side door opens and in walks President Obama. By this time, there had already been tears. Somebody had the good sense to put um, you know, boxes of Kleenex out as, as these people had told their stories. Lots more tears after the president walked out. 
And he greeted them and said, let's go all have lunch at Bus Boys and Poets at 14th and B. <laughs> so Valerie and I and the president got in a limo and they all got in a van and we all drove to Bus Boys and Poets. I took a room in the back room. I tell you, Bus Boys and Poets, the staff knew we were coming, but the people in the front room, they didn't know we were coming, uh, which always terrifies the Secret Service. Um, but men and women who only months earlier had been serving life sentence with no hope of ever being released were meeting in the White House and having lunch with the President of the United States. Definitely tears as they told their stories. Why did President Obama take probably two hours out of his schedule? If you can imagine what his schedule was to hear the stories of those half dozen people And it's really for the same reason that Earl and so many of you support the work of the fishing school. He was giving comfort and hope to real people, one at a time, with real life problems. That instinct is in all of us, including most definitely in the President of the United States, President Obama. That's what initiatives like the Fishing School are about, trying to make young lives better one at a time. As you all know, the work can be frustrating, can be exhausting, can be filled with setbacks. But the people involved can also see when a young kid and his or her family responds, learns to read, learns life skills, there's no greater joy. So I have a couple of letters I'd like to read portions of. Uh, people have found out this event is taking place and gotten some letters in uh, from people who wanted to be uh, participants in tonight's event. The first I want to read is a letter to Kent Sneed from the American College of Trial Lawyers. The president is a guy by the name of Samuel Franklin. Uh, Earl was the president of the American College of Trial Lawyers in uh, from 2000 to 2001 and it's an organization essentially of the premier uh, trial lawyers uh, in the country but it is more than that and I think you'll get a sense as I read this. Dear Mr. Sneed, on behalf of the American College of Trial Lawyers we are delighted to learn of the special tribute to our beloved fellow Earl Silbert recognizing and honoring him for his dedicated service to the fishing school over the years. Earl served as president of the college from 2000 to 2001 with great distinction. The college is an invitation only organization whose members are outstanding trial lawyers who enjoy the highest regard and reputation in their respective communities. Our mission is to improve the standards of trial practice, professionalism, ethics, and the administration of justice, including strong support and respect for the rule of law access to justice and fair and just representation for all parties to legal proceedings. I'll go down a little further. Knowing Earl as I do and what a great trial lawyer he has been throughout his career, he is a person who sets the standard in fulfilling a lawyer's obligation to public service. Thus we are not surprised to learn of the long and extraordinary dedication and service Earl has provided to the fishing school we think it wonderful that this tribute is bestowed upon Earl. It makes all trial lawyers extremely proud, and it certainly will thrill all of our fellows when we hear this news. There's also a letter. I also have a wonderful letter from the DC Bar. The outpouring of love for Earl is just remarkable, I think. This one's addressed to me, uh, dear Mr. Eggleston, on behalf of the District of Columbia Bar, I write in support of the tribute you will bestow upon attorney Earl Silbert at the Fishing School's annual celebration of service. Mr. Silbert has been an active DC Bar member for 55 years. His remarkable legal career, his leadership, and his voluntary service to the courts, the legal profession, and the community have been truly extraordinary. 
We are proud to learn about Mr. Silbert's commitment and service to the fishing school for more than 20 years, which has helped so many children and their families in DC's most underserved communities. We congratulate Mr. Silbert on receiving this honor and wish continued success to the fishing school with its transformative and impactful work in the community. Best wishes from the DC Bar and signed by the president of the DC Bar. And find this, I promise you, this is the last one. Um, but this is from the uh, chairman of the criminal justice se section of the American Bar Association, also a group that knows Earl quite well, also addressed to me. The criminal justice section of the American Bar Association congratulates Earl Silber on his recognition by the fishing school. We know that you're going to be the keynote speaker and wanted you to be aware of the enormous respect CJS, criminal justice system, has for Earl Silber. Some members of our leadership are of an age that they recall Mr. Silbert's key role in the Watergate investigation and his time in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., including his stint as the U.S. Attorney for the district. Even those of us who were not in D.C. when Mr. Silbert was a prosecutor know his reputation as a fair-minded lawyer who sought justice in every case. And many of us know his reputation as a criminal defense lawyer following his prosecutorial years. As the current chair of CJS, I have canvassed some of the leadership who knew Mr. Silbert best. They describe him as one of the lawyers they respect the most because he is devoted to the principle of equal justice under law. Some say that if the entire bar emulated Earl Silbert, justice in the United States would improve dramatically. The unanimous view of those of, of, to whom I spoke was that Earl Silbert is a role model for conscientious prosecutors, dedicated defense lawyers, and lawyers of all stripes who are devoted to protecting the constitutional rights of every person, regardless of that person's wealth or community stature. I love this last line. It is apparent that when there is the battle to protect civil rights and constitutional rights, CJS lawyers would enlist in any army led by Earl Silbert. They trust him and admire him and celebrate him. So I've been kind of worried I've been spending too much time saying nice things about Earl. So just a little, those of you who know him, I don't know, is the best word quirky? <laughs> a little quirky, maybe. So, um, so I've asked around uh, about Earl, and I've learned some things I didn't really know, which is one, as, as people probably know, he learned to play hockey when he was, but was in Boston, very avid uh, hockey player. And when he came to D.C., he continued to play, and he played in, 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 uh, for a while in what they were calling the senior leagues. And the senior leagues basically are for people who are playing in their 40s and 50s. Well, that definition was too constraining for Earl. Earl, I, I don't know. I assume Earl's not still playing. Uh, I saw him with a cane, after all, although maybe on ice skates he doesn't need the cane. Uh, but uh, Earl, I think, played into his 70s, uh, continued with, with the passion uh, that he always had. The second thing I learned about Earl is that um, he's a great dancer. <laughs> so I don't mean to be gender specific here, but all men in the room know that our wives want us to be great dancers. I'm an utter failure at this. My wife is here, she can tell you that she has the bruises from these efforts. And, uh, but Earl is actually a great dancer, but more than a great dancer, he's apparently the winner of numerous limbo contests in the District of Columbia. And, and like, who knew about Earl? He is lithe and thin, but who really knew? The last thing I wanna, and, every, and people who know him, and particularly his partners are here know, that uh, Earl is famously cheap. <laughs> now this is a trait I can relate to because I am famously cheap. But uh, there's a great story his partners like to tell. He, um, one of the things is that law firms have to bring, particularly big law firms, like to bring in new uh, lawyers. And there's a, like a recruiting process that's a little like courtship, which is 
the fancier the restaurant you take them to, the more they, they are going to think you want them, right? So uh, Earl takes this, uh, this uh, recruit to a Chinese restaurant. And for Earl, it was a nicer Chinese restaurant than he usually went to. <laughs> but he, um, when Earl went to a Chinese restaurant, he always ate off the preset menu, which is a good deal, mind you. You basically get three courses, and the tea is free. So the, the recruit, so the, there's a preset menu, and there's usually the a la carte menu, but the preset menu is usually separate. And so the recruit doesn't look at the preset menu and starts looking at the a la carte menu. So Earl puts up this for a while, starts to get kind of fidgety, finally says to the recruit, well, really, the preset menu is where you want to be ordering all of them. I really have no idea whether his law firm got that recruit. Uh, I'm sure that his partners were thrilled about his uh, care uh, with, uh, with which he uh, dealt with the firm's money. So let me just, uh, by way of conclusion, I just want to finish with Earl's integrity and decency and how much it matters. And I hope I'm not getting overly political here. So if I do, you know, you can boo or throw something at me. But look, I, I mean, we live in scary times, I think. We are seeing a return of overt and state-sanctioned racism in this country. As President Obama said in a speech in Illinois a few weeks ago, how hard would it have been to condemn Nazis marching in Charlottesville? We give tax cuts to large corporations and the wealthy, and then we introduce bills to cut people off food stamps and other assistance programs. We separate parents from their children at the border. People in power are still trying to cut health care for millions of Americans who for the first time will not be facing financial ruin if they have a health emergency. We praise Russia and North Korea, and we attack Canada, Germany, the FBI. Earl's example of integrity shines brightly in times such as these. Earl doesn't tweet nastiness. Earl doesn't say nastiness. I can tell you that I'm honored to call Earl Silbert my friend. Earl, everyone in this room and beyond salutes your commitment to the fishing school, to integrity, and to the rule of law. You are a guiding light. Thank you very much.